Thank you. I will start recording now. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so just to review, I'm uh, Kevin Silverstein, and I am a scientific lead at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, and I'm also uh, operations manager for uh, GEMS, um, and GEMS is the platform that we'll be talking about and demoing today. Uh, my background is uh, computer science originally, then uh, did my PhD in uh, biophysics, and then moved into bioinformatics and. 1998, I guess that is 20 years ago, scarily, <laughs> and and I uh, have focused a lot uh, in my back in my history uh, as a bioinformaticist, actually in plant microbe interactions, a lot in uh, large uh, gene families of, of small antimicrobial peptides and things of that sort, and did a lot of uh, both molecular evolution as well as other um, uh, evolution of genome structure, architecture, and structure uh, analyses. Uh, in the past, and then more recently, I've been and uh, you know working on developing this infrastructure um, much more geared towards um, folks that are interested in uh, in breeding and 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 plant uh, basically, but not just plant. Actually, we're <laughs> we're moving a little bit pretty much agriculture because we're moving even more into livestock and things of that sort as well. Um, but GEMS stands for uh, G for genetics and genomics by E, environment. Uh, of course, a lot of folks work in the G by E space. Uh, that's a very important to us in thinking about the, the uh, phenotypic outcomes. But also keeping in mind of the management, the farmer's management practices, that's what the M stands for, and how that affects the ultimate phenotypes. And finally, the socioeconomic status, uh, the S part. Uh, socioeconomics plays a big, big role in moving away from just focusing on uh, trait uh, development so we can get to Trait deployment and figuring out is there a market for it? Uh, are these uh, products, um, you know, marketable? What is the practicalities of the whole situation? And so that's why we want to consider the whole spectrum. Um, we'll show you a bunch of the tools that help to make data interoperable between these different disparate domains. Um, and uh, in fact, most of the effort so far in GEMS has been basically creating a sharing and analysis platform, uh, the very basics of it. Um, we are uh, finished our uh, soft beta release, and we're working on incorporating all sorts of feedback and changes and things of like that on the platform to where we uh, hope uh, by the our, our next IAA or International Agroinformatics Alliance meeting, um, probably in May ish, to actually have a full uh, uh, actual uh, release as opposed to beta. Um, and we'll, we'll see. Um, we're working towards that, um, and. Um, Anyway, you get to see the, uh, a little bit about uh, what the platform is. I, I encourage you to stop me at any point. Uh, it looks like the Zoom works very well, and some things um, you, you kind of you lose your voice when someone else talks. This one sounds good, and that actually, I can actually hear you <laughs> when I'm speaking. So uh, please just chime in and stop me at any point. Um, I, I like this outline of topics that uh, Star forwarded because it kind of covers a lot of the things that I was hoping to. Uh, at least begin sharing as to start the conversation. Um, and one of them was she asked uh, about uh, why did we, you know, why choose Jupiter versus galaxy? Um, or even uh, GEMS is not based on galaxy, it is based on Jupiter. Uh, and, um, and a couple of the, uh, the things about that, they're both actually really good interfaces. I did make the comment to both Star and Yao that actually Galaxy decided not to choose uh, because if you look at the main Galaxy product, they're actually offering you an option to have a nice Dockerized version of Jupiter right in Galaxy, and you can work directly within the Galaxy framework now using Jupiter. So, uh, or you can use their you know their usual interface. So um, it turns out you don't have to choose. <laughs> um, uh, so a couple things about Galaxy. We actually thought about expanding Galaxy at the University of Minnesota in 2011. We actually uh, were one of the earliest adopters of the Galaxy outside Penn State. Uh, and we, to this day, have two full-time uh, programmers that have been working since 2011 on the Galaxy project, contributing things back. Uh, and we uh, have a major NSF grant that was dedicated towards uh, basically uh, incorporating all the tools of proteomics into Galaxy. And so that's been going on, I think, for four years now, uh, centered here at the University of Minnesota. So we're very, uh, we know a lot about Galaxy. 
and yet we chose to build gems outside of it, not because of the weaknesses of Galaxy as a tool, it's fantastic, um, but it, it wasn't appropriate for what we wanted to achieve, okay? Um, let me see, um, it's just a little correspondence I have with Jesse about some of those things. Um, this is a lot of text, I don't, I'm not gonna go through this text. Um, this is an exchange that Jesse and I had, um, but there were a couple of things. We knew we had to, to build uh, a few things. One, um, one of them was to, the interoperability was so key to GEMS that we knew we needed to adopt very uh, carefully a lot of um, ontologies, uh, fixed vocabularies, uh, and to use that information uh, to make it, make it uh, interoperable. And Galaxy, although it has very good uh, data types, it's, it's very good about allowing you to define all sorts of um, uh, extensions to your data and saying, I want to make sure that if I need a FASTA file, that it will only accept a FASTA file, things of that sort. But it's done in a rather ad hoc way. And at this point in time, they don't really have a good way to, to uh, interoperate um, a lot of these ontologies and vocabularies to make sure that people are using regularized uh, nomenclatures um, within their system. So that was one thing we knew we have to build. It doesn't discount using Galaxy. Uh, the other thing is Galaxy is extremely focused on G, extremely focused on genetics, the genomic components. Um, and uh, we, with our experience in actually building out all the proteomics, we realized, wow, if we were gonna extend this to a lot of the environmental information, uh, farmer management and socioeconomic data, uh, it was a lot of extra work to get that done. And we knew that that, that was gonna be a bit of a challenge to us. The, the Galaxy is good in that it allows you to share your data sets and your workflows and all sorts of things with other users. But if you actually look behind the scenes, it's very ad hoc. It's one user to one user. They don't have, they do have concept of having groups at some level, but not sharing data with individuals and their groups and not separating out the metadata about the data. It always comes with together as a package. And we very, very uh, importantly wanted to make sure we separated out the metadata so that Pepsi, for example, one of our collaborators and a, a heavy uh, anticipated user of our system could say, here, I want to throw all my metadata out there so that people could find out where I'm planting what, but not actually share their data unless they came to an agreement to explicitly share the data. And, and that's, not, that's not possible within the Galaxy framework. Um, another thing about Galaxy is all the users are in one giant playground together. And for security purposes, for all sorts of purposes, we actually have our, every user has their own uh, complete isolated container. Everybody drops into a single system in their own separate containers so that there is no way that one user could ever leak over or see or anything, even do a process list or ever see any of the activities of another user because they're effectively in different worlds. And the only way they could ever see them is through our gem share access layer, the software layer, so that then they can see uh, other users' activities or only what the other users expose to them. So that's very, very crucial. Um, and Galaxy is just too loose uh, for the extreme control to make it through uh, Pepsi's audit, to make it through Land O'Lakes audit, to make it through all the other companies and other folks that we would deal with, that was never gonna, never gonna pass. Um, let's see, number five. Uh, oh, um, th that was Jesse's comment that um, Galaxy, although Star and I have just had a discussion, she's very, very correct in her point that um, you can hide intermediate uh, uh, data sets from individuals when you do a workflow, because otherwise we know how they get overwhelmed when you return 37 data sets <laughs> from a process. And you can hide about 35 of those 37 if you like, and that's actually really good. Um, even the tools themselves have lots and lots and lots of detail that overwhelms users, and you kind of have to develop a user interface on top of the Galaxy. And we thought it would be better um, you know, just to use our own. And the last point is just that um, everything is so nimble in this field, things are so, our specs are changing all the time that we wanted to actually build upon a lot of open source technologies that we could change out and uh, flip in a new one and not be stuck with this big monolithic uh, 
code that is Galaxy now that's been around since uh, literally um, 2004. Uh, and uh, we, so we just thought that having our new uh, code based on new open source projects would be, would be a good way to, to go. Any, any thoughts or other comments on, on that just um, before uh, I move on to the actual demo and uh, other discussions? So you're saying, Kevin, that Jupyter solves a lot of these issues? Or it provides you with. So I, I guess um, here that you're right. Thank you because I did not really fully address the question. Hers was Jupiter versus Galaxy, and I'm talking about why we didn't use Galaxy as our primary thing. Uh -huh. So um, let's let me focus on the question instead of answering my own question. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, so Jupiter um, is a is another way to actually have uh, all these individual data sets, workflows that you can do, just like Galaxy. Um, it's a little bit, le uh, I'd say its challenges are for the, the naive biological user, for example, is that they don't really offer that, that nice little, you know, if you've seen the workflow tool in Galaxy, it's wonderful. You've got these little boxes with spaghetti things that link one box to the next box. You can click on, change the activities. That's, that's a very nice and intuitive uh, interface. Um, Jupyter, I say it rests a little bit closer to the geek's heart and, and less to the, to the naive uh, um, user, which, which a lot of biologists have less uh, experience with code. Jupyter also exposes you to R or Python or whatever your kernel, the, the, the language that you're actually using. And a lot of people don't, frankly don't want to see that, 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 uh, that code. They don't want to, at least in the, the slightly older generation of biologists. The younger ones are actually starting to do some R for sure, and sometimes some Python. Um, so I still think Galaxy is actually, if you really want to hit uh, a naive to programming uh, audience, uh, is, is a very nice platform to go for. Um, it, it requires writing a lot of more wrappers, uh, but those aren't difficult to, to write. So, um, there, so Jupyter mainly more for developers, right? Not for, as you, your words, naive uh, programming audience. I, I feel like that. I, I would agree with you, Star. I, I think it's, it feels to me like it looks a little bit, it's too daunting for a lot of uh, native biologists, you know, when I show it to them, when we talk about it, because it really requires you to know some programming. So. Okay. Uh, GMs basically you build a user interface on top of Jupyter. So we're doing it in two phases. I'll show you I'll show you an example of where we've used Jupyter, and that's the first phase. That's to get that's to make sure the tools exist, and then I'll show you what we did with one of those user interfaces, uh, and what we're going to be expanding many of them more out. Our, our next uh, between now and May, we have a huge focus on user interfaces. That's like about 90% of the effort between now and May and what's going to go on. Uh, or no, I wouldn't say 90%, it's a good portion of it because I can't put percentages because we're actually in the middle of our discussions about <laughs> what our priorities are. But it's very clear that that, that has to be a big focus. Um, and, um, and that's because to make it more accessible to that group of uh, researchers that don't have programming experience. Because you can do the same thing in, in uh, Jupyter as you can with the user uh, interface, it's just that Jupyter is more powerful because you, you, you can do so many more things um, there because you can pretty much anything you can program, you can do. What's IAA stuff? That's the International Agroinformatics Alliance. Um, our, our group, when we correspond together, uh, I think some folks, are, we originally called ourselves the International Agroinformatics Alliance, and then we realized actually what we're building is a platform that serves the International Agroinformatics Alliance. And because that acronym came first, um, uh, you know, uh, that's the way we used to advertise ourselves, and a lot of people still call us the IAA, and it, that's a much larger beast. That includes uh, all sorts of organizations like uh, many members of the CG, uh, particularly uh, um, CIMA, CIAT, uh, it also includes University of Stellenbosch, University of Adelaide, University, I mean, all sorts of different partners that we have in this big alliance. Um, but GEMS is the platform. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, why don't we um, kind of move over to uh, discussing a little bit about the file transfer uh, system. Um, 
I don't know if um, Star, can you see who's logged on? Is Jesse logged on at this yeah, point? So. Hi, Jesse. Hello. Hey, Jesse. Um, so one of the things that we want to, so well, actually, Jesse, everyone else did introductions, so um, <laughs> you might as well at least introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Jesse Erdman. I'm the uh, tech lead uh, for, for the GEMS platform. All right, excellent. So, um, okay. so on the line, we have uh, Lee Jones, Gobi Director. I was actually here for the introductions. I just didn't, didn't butt in. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Okay, good. All right. So we can go on. All right. So, um, so let's see. So I think one of the things that Jesse can uh, basically demonstrate is uh, the file transfer. As I told uh, Star, I messed up my uh, Globus uh, connection uh, shortly before. So Jesse will, will show that. And then, uh, then I can do pretty much everything else on the, the system or um, uh, whatever is needed. Either of us can do it. Just depends on how it comes up. So. Sure. Um, so that means I, I think, Jesse, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the sharing and then transfer it over to you, assuming you're, you're equipped and ready to, to do so. Yep. Okay. Here is one green button on the bottom if you pull down your cursor. Yeah, I, I've, I've got that. I'm just trying to make sure that I share the right screen. I've got three Monitor, screens. Okay. Uh, three monitors, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's building now. Nice. Okay. All right. So uh, can you see my Jupyter Lab terminal? Okay, we see a terminal. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess I'm going to jump in here. And then maybe Kevin will backtrack and, and show you a little bit of other, other things that are going on. But um, so for the purposes of this demo, uh, normally on our, our primary installation, we have Globus Institutional Endpoint running. And so when you log in, by, uh, by default, you already have a Globus Endpoint that's available. Uh, and I'll show you how to connect to that in a second. But because I'm running on my laptop, uh, I've installed a a personal endpoint, which I had to launch from the, the command line here. But it is running. Um, so, the, so the key thing that I want to show you in this window is we're going to transfer in a file um, called Simit ETH data, so um, our ETH trials. Uh, and so the, there, there's nothing here by that name right now. Uh, so let me jump over to our, I'll restart this. So when you uh, connect to Globus and you want to um, start transferring files, uh, one thing that you would do is you'd come to this window and this is their, their panel. Uh, so it authenticates you. Uh, maybe I can, yeah. So uh, it'll authenticate you, it'll drop you into this window. And you would want to connect to one side of the transfer that you're going to do. In this particular case, the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute has exposed all of our home directories as endpoints that you can connect to. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and connect to my home directory at the Supercomputing Institute. Getting used, they just changed this interface and I'm getting used to it. So if I Yeah, I know. It, I was looking at this morning and I said, what in the world is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, if, for instance, I wanted to transfer. Uh, the file manager, is this like in-house uh, program or is some kind of open source program? This is actually uh, through globus.org. Um, it is out of the University of Chicago, I believe, but it's a, a global uh, grid FTP system. So when you log in, um, you usually use your, your home institution's credentials as, as long as your home institution has in is part of the In Common Federation, which I believe uh, Cornell probably is. Yeah, they definitely. Yeah, pretty much anyone uh, th that uses Edgerome uh, is pretty much connected. Yeah. Globus.org. Yep. Globus.org. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so there, there's endpoints all over the place. It's just a matter of whether you, know, you have access to them. 
so in this case, I connected to the Super Computing Institute. This is my personal home directory, so you can see all the stuff that I've got stored in there. But if I want to transfer this file from the Super Computing Institute to the endpoint running on my laptop, uh, I click on Transfer or Sync, and then now it's split the pane uh, so that I can choose another endpoint. And this is the one that I just set up on my laptop. So you can see, uh, sorry, between this view and this view, it's the same set of files. And I've already selected my file that I want to transfer, so I can just start that. Um, and it gives me a handy little task ID so I can watch it transfer. And I'll also, if this were a larger file, I might be more reliant on the fact that it emails me when the, the transfer is complete. Um, but we'll give it a second to actually transfer that over to my laptop. Okay, and it says it's done. Um, I'll, if I don't have it already, I'll be uh, getting a new email that'll look very much like this one. <laughs> um, and now you can see that I've got this data over here. In Jupyter Lab, I can op open it up and take a peek at, oh, uh, it thinks it's a CSV, but it's a tab to limited file, so. <laughs> Uh, let's see, let me change that to tab, there. Uh, so yeah, it gives you a nice view of, of what's in the file. And so that, that's our primary method of, of transferring data into the platform uh, because it, uh, they've architected it to be based off grid FTP. Uh, that was kind of the or, or origin of Globus and that allows you to deal with uh, high latency connections, connections that have that drop, it'll persist. Uh, if a transfer fails par partway through, it will just sit and wait in the background, and as soon as both ends are able to connect to each other, it'll resume from where it left off. So that's that's really good for if you're dealing with, with places that don't have a solid internet connection. Um, of course, that's just one method. Uh, once you get into our container, you can SCP or SSH around. So if I wanted to get that, that same file um, from MSI, instead I could just, uh, it's, fall, uh, it's small enough that I, I'm not too worried about the, uh, the connection if it drops out. So I could get a similar file. I'll get the one that is actually just the slightly different named version of it and I can just use SCP for that. So really once you get into it here, there, there's any number of ways that you can, uh, you can get access to it and you can see that I just transferred that in from MSI. Um, and, but I, I think that at least from a, a quick high level uh, is how we are, we're transferring data in. Uh, so unless there's specific questions, I think I'll hand it back over to to Kevin, so we yeah, can get into so Jesse, what's the upper limit of the file to transfer? Um, you know, I think you can do terabytes of data. This is really meant to connect supercomputers to other supercomputing institutions. Um, they use it a lot in the Exceed network, I believe, to get get data in. Um, so I, I don't think there's an upper limit. That, that was my understanding. Uh, my understanding is exactly how it's, uh, there is not any upper limit that I know of and that uh, literally it could be days, weeks transfer uh, and that's okay. It'll keep trying the packets and you can keep doing it. I see. Were you able to open it if it's really large? Uh, we have not. Well, so there, once you have it in the Jupyter environment, there's lots of different ways that you can access data. Um, so by default, you would be uh, using perhaps uh, pandas, which would try to load the whole thing into memory, uh, which is not going to work very well. But we do also have Apache Spark installed. So I could, uh, for instance, start a, a PySpark notebook. And um, what that allows you to do is define the number of partitions you want. So it, when you do operations, it'll only load one partition of the data at a time and do processing on it. And that, um, so you, you can use file or process files that are larger than memory using that. 
Similarly, you could also, if you're more familiar with the, the Pandas way of working with things, uh, there's a project called Dask available from the same people that make Conda, uh, Anaconda, uh, that allows you to do parallel processing on files. It'll, it'll manage the splitting of the files into uh, discrete, smaller chunks that you can uh, process as well. I haven't tested, I believe, this new viewer for at least tab or uh, tabular data in Jupyter will only load a portion of the file at a time, but I haven't actually tested that to see if I open one that's larger than the memory, if this, this particular viewer holds up. And all of our tools in the future will be back to using uh, either Dask or Apache Spark uh, so that we can process files that are larger than the memory that's available on the system. That's very nice. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. All right, I'll stop sharing and uh, you can pick it up. All right. Share screen. Okay, we're back here. Let's see. Um, I will move this one out. Don't need that anymore. Hey, hey Jesse, a quick question. Um, that I know we were supposed to have a tools discussion at 1.30. Did you cancel that or are you going to? I did, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have you head off. You can either stick around or you can, I don't, you know, I think, I think I should be able to handle the rest of it. It's just uh, having just broken the one part, uh, <laughs> everything else I assume is working. So. Okay. Well, I'll hang out for a few minutes anyway, just in case it's it's helpful. Cool. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Um, so what Jesse showed you right there was um, part of what Globus brings to us. Uh, part of it is being able to transfer files, no matter uh, how small, how big, and and even in, as he said, high latency networks. If you're in Sub-Saharan Africa and you literally uh, are uh, losing your internet uh, continuously. Uh, it will keep trying and keep trying, and you can transfer your data successfully. Turns out that the CG, uh, as of today, uh, through the Big Data Initiative, has uh, finalized their uh, subscription. Uh, they are actually have chosen to purchase Globus, so now the CG is going to have the benefits of being able to transfer uh, data, um, say, for the folks from CIMIT, can now transfer, well, in the future, <laughs> will be able to transfer data to their operations in Kenya. And other places because they now will have Globus, so that's 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 cool. Um, so the other thing that Globus brings us is actually authentication. We didn't want to be in the business of storing passwords on our system. Uh, we wanted to rely on uh, actually everyone being able to sign in in their own institution as they desired. So uh, what you can do uh, in Gems or the way that you log in is you would sign in, uh, would we'll, we'll check through Globus. Um, and again, Globus uh, would basically give you an opportunity to log into pretty much anything. So if I were in Cornell, yeah, so there's Cornell. Um, I'm not, <laughs> not going to sign it. Actually, I can, out of curiosity, what does it look like when you sign in? Um, I'm going to uh, Cornell. Oh, is that, okay. is that, does that look familiar? Okay. Yeah. It doesn't look familiar to me, but anyway, <laughs> let me go back because um, I don't have an account in Cornell. Um, <laughs> so I will actually change this to Minnesota because th there I do have an account. Oops. Um, yeah. If I can type, it'll work. All right. So, I mean, it's basically using this uh, in common interface to give us, oh, so see it, it. So, one thing about this thing is it's really persistent. Here, let me try to. I have forgotten. I guess I forgot to do something here. Um, so the good thing is it's really persistent and it stores in your cookies uh, the, your last login so that when you do detach from the internet, you don't have to go back to Globus uh, and check uh, with the authentication. It's stored your credentials already. Um, the bad thing about it is when I'm giving demos, uh, it didn't, doesn't give me an opportunity. <laughs> uh, let me stop my server, uh, log out, and then clear my cookies, darn it. <laughs> So you can see um, here. Because uh, it's persistent. A little bugger. Where's there it is? Clear. Clear cookies. All right. All right. So now let's go back. All 
There we go. See, ours looks different than yours. Uh, but this is what I'm used to looking at. Oops. And basically, it just redirects back to Gems uh, after it's logged you in, and you get to see the server set up. Um, so this is what Gems looks like. It gives you a few options. Um, there are the uh, some ways. Uh, actually, let me just briefly show you this different ways to interface, and then I'll actually show you sharing data. So one of them is through uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, as I said, it used to be Jupyter Notebooks. Now it's Jupyter Lab. Uh, actually, Jessica just showed you really what that environment looked like, but you'll see in, in mine uh, what mine looks like. Um, it basically just shows me my main login. I can go into directories, uh, tools, and for example, um, we'll go here. And then I can load a notebook, uh, which we'll play with in a little bit. Uh, this is one of the notebooks, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that and compare it with Galaxy if necessary. The other way to actually launch into a lot of folks are actually used to an R Studio interface, um, because we found that a lot of biologists are very used to programming in R, uh, and they're very comfortable with R Studio, and so uh, built right here into this. Uh, interface through Jupyter uh, is an R Studio in the same environment that people are used to uh, to do their R code. So that's that's handy to have that. And as if that weren't enough uh, ways to do the stuff that they want to do, they could also actually have a desktop interface. Um, which, uh, like this, then they could actually use native apps. I know that folks at Simit uh, love to uh, play with. Uh, let's see. That's uh, not the bin I wanted. Um, oh, I want my file system. Sorry. So is this kind of like a remote desktop in, onto a server? Yes, uh, pretty much. This is. It's just all. These are so many different views of effectively your workspace uh, over here. You've got your workspace on this machine this virtual machine, and it's so many different views into it. And I can do my processing. I can do standard Unix commands in here on the desktop. Um, the important thing about this one, though, is if there are applications like Helium, for example, um, let me see. If I, I think I have been, uh, I think that's where, yeah. So I installed Helium here, uh, which, which, oops, which works. Um, on this platform, uh, I'm sorry, on this particular thing, and I can actually load, for example, a pedigree data that I had collected. And if I remember where, where it's in your desktop. It's on your desktop, so you have to go up a level. Yeah, so desktop, and I think I put it in demo. Oops, I think it was actually example one. And there. And so this is, for example, a pedigree that I had been working with, uh, and I can actually visualize this pedigree uh, you know, with the Helium tool. I mean, you can basically work with a whole bunch of different tools. That's the nice thing is so many different ways that you may, well, that you may be able to work with your data. Um, you talked about, or one of the things you wanted to see is how, uh, how we can actually share data files within this uh, system with people. And then we'll actually talk about some of the analyses. So, there's a bunch of users, potentially, uh, which I can go to check out the users here. This demo system has me, but it has a bunch of other fake made up people. Uh, and uh, I suppose Jesse used a little bit of humor. It could have used even more humor but, uh, in developing these users. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you have users, um, their Globus uh, information. They can belong to different teams. Uh, and the teams you can think of as groups uh, of any arbitrary makeup that people can have. Uh, for example, um, there's one that's not arbitrary, and that's Gems Open. So Gems Open is a group that we want to incentivize people to uh, share and make open as much data as, as they want or as they can. Uh, by default, I mean, in general, uh, a lot of people may keep their data private to themselves. They may share it with just a few groups or a few individuals. 
uh, or they could actually make their data completely open to everybody. And to encourage that, uh, you know, we uh, are been playing with ideas about uh, storage fees and things of that sort. Uh, obviously, you know, the resources at GEMS aren't free uh, in the sense that, you know, we can't just store everything from everybody. Uh, so generally, uh, people who have an account have a certain amount of storage that they can have without uh, any charges. But beyond that, it would have to be, uh, you know, some type of subscription charges for more storage. That said, if they freed it up to be completely open, it goes to a common area that they would not be charged for. And so we're trying to incentivize people to make it free. So Gems Open is a particular group uh, that would be free to all. Um, this Uni Ag, made up Uni uh, Ag Corp Corporation, is uh, composed of only two users at the moment, Alice Ag Agricorp and Professor Bob. Uh, they both have view and review permissions. What does that mean? We can go to help and find out more information and share data. Um, we can actually see the various different permissions for sharing uh, as to what people can do at the sharing level. Uh, and you can, you can see that there's different gradations um, to what permissions you have over files and data sets and things of that sort. Um, going to teams again, these are all the different teams that are on the system. Uh, there are team, uh, let's see, we have, um, what's non, nonprofit is just Kathy nonprofit. So there can be teams of just an individual. Uh, likewise, in individual products. At the moment, this demo system doesn't have a whole lot of products. Um, it has pretty much a bunch of different data. If we want to actually search for keywords within or, or phrases or things within there, um, if we want to find, say, Kenya, oops, then we can quickly uh, go down to the Kenya data. Uh, this has some information about who uh, it, who the authorized users are, uh, but, and, and a description. If we actually want to get the data, this, these are data products that um, we have access to. If we actually want to get the data, uh, remember that I said everyone's data is kind of walled off from each of the other users. And so if you want to actually get a data, you, you will need to get a copy of it in your own playground, either a copy or a symbolic link, depending on how, what's the most efficient way to store it on the system. And assuming that you have access to the data, uh, uh, you can basically go and get this data product, uh, accept the license. This is a very exciting license here <laughs> uh, to, to get access to that data. Accept meaningless text. Yeah, I guess that's what most legally looks like to me, Jesse. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> I'll accept that license. Um, and then what happens is you now actually have the data is resting uh, on your system. So the Kenya data file uh, is placed. Oh, I see. It's not placed. I have to choose where to save it. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I could save the file. Um, so Kevin, when, when you save it, does it make a copy, a new copy of that file, or does it just create a link for you? If at all possible, it makes a link, a symbolic link to make sure it is. Um, so wait a minute, hold a sec. Jesse, are you still on? Yep. Um, is that true? Because what if they alter the, because uh, we don't let them alter other people's data. How, right, how do so you the, the links are read only. If you want to make changes or if you uh, decide that the, the data that you get isn't clean enough, you can create your own copy of it uh, from, from the link. The, oh, okay, so by default, it creates a link. I, I'm sorry. So by, by default, it creates a link to that data, right? You have to want to create a copy before it makes a copy of that entire data. Yeah, creating a copy is a manual step. The, the okay. Putting it into your, your workspace, it, it just creates a symbolic link um, okay. to the, that, the that's file, which is read only for you. Yeah, because otherwise you have a huge uh, buildup of lots of extra yeah. stuff. Yeah, the, the only yeah. time it would, so in the future when we have federated nodes, you know, uh, Kevin mentioned that we have partners at, at the University of Adelaide and, and South Africa, and we have a vision in the future of, of providing federated nodes that would be local to users in, at the University of Adelaide or, or Stellenbosch University in South Africa. 
And so if the data that you're requesting doesn't happen to already exist on the node that you're connected to, in the background, it would start a Globus transfer to move that data to the node local to you. And then it would notify you that, hey, I've, it might take a while before this data is available. We'll let you know when it's, when it's ready. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. Uh, before we go on, I just want to check. Uh, we did start 10 minutes later, so I don't know. Do you guys want to set up another session or to not file before 3? You know, it's, it's, it just depends on what your availability is. I, I actually don't have other commitments uh, this afternoon, so I'm happy to go as long as it's useful for you. Uh, and that, or we could set up another session either, either way. So for the four topics on the agenda, how much longer you think? Um, let's see. Another 15 minutes, can we finish within 20 minutes? Great. Yeah. Yeah, we should be able to finish within 20 minutes. I was just going to go to analysis. We've gone file transfer, data permissions, uh, system data sharing, um, we haven't fully done yet, but um, yeah, cleaning, validation, and curation tools. Um, yeah, I think 20 minutes would be fun. All right. So Kevin, yeah. I'm going to drop out now. <laughs> yep, fair enough. Thank you for answering that key question and see you later. <laughs> yep, see you. Thank you, right. DSE. Yep, thanks. All right, so um, save it into the desktop, current location, save. Oops, that's because I didn't name it. Uh. Okay, data has been retrieved. Um, so basically that's what it means. It's been retrieved from the central repository or a link has been made. Um, the, ni the nice thing is, uh, Jesse mentioned uh, subtly, is that if we make variants of a file, then you, it would save as a new file, but then actually it makes a link to the original file. So we actually, they're versioned, all file changes are versioned, and you'll see we actually tack on a lot of metadata to each data product. So if we go back to the data share, that gives us an opportunity to take data that we actually have uh, within our system and start um, basically curating it as we bring it into the system. So I can go here and I can go um, find my directory that I want. For example, I have data and data. And I have a lot of stuff. This is from actually Land Lakes data, which I probably shouldn't have here. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's actually, it's all completely uh, de-identified. So that's not, not a problem, but, um, but let's see. So here, why don't we go with the, this table experiment. That comes from Simit. You guys know the Simit folks, and that's, that's all data that they're happy to have exchanged. So the thing about this is um, this is curation system, um, this is what I meant by we, this is, we added a user interface. We actually have a Jupyter notebook that does everything that I'm about to show you here, but it's really uh, complex, and it's actually a bit difficult for naive users to navigate. Um, programming people have no problem with it, but, uh, but this is much friendlier. So this allows you to basically it automatically figures out whether that it was tab limited. I could switch it to comma. That's not quite right. Space wouldn't quite do it right either. Tab it was correct. Uh, the first row basically is all the headers. Um, I can move on and start tacking on a lot of metadata in order for me to metadata attack attach metadata for each column. It has to actually scan the entire file because it's going to figure out what are the low and the high for every column field. It's gonna figure out whether it's an integer, whether it's a uh, floating point, uh, character text, things of that sort, and then give me an opportunity to add my notes on each of the uh, columns. So it's, it, basically it, it will scan uh, and pretty much add a lot of information that could be later used in here. So sure enough, experiment ID indeed uh, is an integer. That's what it figured, these are, um, you know, dates, text, locations, things of that sort. Um, we could try to change this. It will flag that just to make sure that you sure you know what you're doing. Uh, lows and highs. The nice thing about these um, other values that are actually text is it'll give you a sampling of things that are in there. And that's pretty nice. Um, so uh, we can make comments, reading, programs, 
must have uh, um, simit as first field. You know, you can make whatever comment you want. Um, to, and this all gets tacked on as metadata or uh, in a JSON file. It says this column has this name, it has this data type, it has this min, this max, notes, et cetera. And that will all get pushed forward uh, to the final JSON file that, that uh, finishes in the end. Next, after you do that, it tries to match these to ontologies. Uh, we actually have um, eight ontologies in here, plus two vocabulary sets, uh, ICASA and the Agrivoke vocabularies. Um, even if it can't, it, using Elasticsearch, it matches to the closest one uh, of the, uh, each of these headers. And even if it doesn't match, you can actually find uh, alternative um, matches. So for example, here's location. We probably won't, don't want lactation. Um, that's not the right one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's matching both on, uh, because it uses Elasticsearch, it matches both on some mis uh, mis spelling mistakes as well as that matches on equivalent words and uh, in, the, in the ontology, et cetera. So name of series probably fits with series name. Uh, year, sure enough, uh, year from ICASA, et cetera. You can go on and fix these uh, as you desire all the way down series until they're all fixed. Then you can actually continue with your data cleaning. I've matched them on top to ontologies. I can continue with my data cleaning and start looking at each individual column and say, um, what are all the different potential uh, misspellings that might be in each of these columns? And here it's identified that although there are 4,090 uh, occurrences of CIMIT uh, headquarters, lowland, tropical, capital L, capital T, there's the all lowercase version, 17 entries of that, all caps, one entry, and lowercase L, capital T version, one of those. So sure, I would want to update those spellings because you don't want inconsistencies within your data set. And so on, you find all sorts of same thing with Kenya, Ethiopia, et cetera. I could just select all, don't be too careless about selecting all, but do actually check them, make sure that they're correct, and then save the changes. Likewise, you can go to all of the other columns and see if there are interesting uh, spelling errors, et cetera, that occurred to that. Once you, Kevin, how, are you, how are you finding all those spelling errors? Are you basically looking for just the standard set of uppercase, lowercase, spaces, formatting? So currently, um, there's a, a few ways. So it's uh, up to two mismatches, I believe. Uh, the Lowenstein distance uh, are things that are flagged, as well as, you know, that includes uh, capitalization, et cetera. Um, it also uh, actually has a thesaurus and a dictionary. So it's the thesaurus of common terms that could be swapped, and that can be added to uh, both custom as well as some central ones. Uh, in the future, we'd like to use ontological terms and add those in. Those aren't currently being uh, incorporated, but basically it could be, uh, you know, expanded uh, to increase those, uh, the, th the source of terms. But that's a good point. And what, what's changing in the background there? You... Oh, yeah, that's, something. those are samplings. Just to give you an idea, yeah, exactly what yeah, I said. It's, it's sampling just different fields in each of those columns. So, now, in, terms, in terms of the ontology, is it able to, I know right now it, it identifies um, uh, the same spelling with different uh, capitalizations. Is it able to differentiate, so for instance, uh, color with O-R and color with O-U-R? So, so you, these are language, uh, even with English variant. Uh, yes. Um, so yep, there is no are and things like that. Yeah, so um, those can be included uh, if we added those uh, language uh, variants into the um, thesaurus, those could be included. Uh, okay. at, by default, they aren't at the moment. We have that issue actually with, um, uh, with Simmons data. They actually have, uh, I'm trying to think, it was in their management. Here, hold on a sec. Um, let, me, let me cancel this. Uh, is it in here? Um, they have agriculture, uh, conservation, uh, and conference, conference, uh, conservation, um, or, uh, so the, these are not handled very well at the moment. Um, so these should all actually all be the same and they should all point to the same thing. And we're working on ways to actually get, 
it's exactly what you said, some language variants and even crossing uh, into Spanish and some other common languages for some of our agricultural partners to try to uh, reconcile those. But you can see these are, this is an example where it's not working uh, as well as one would like for that reason. So all of, all of those um, text corrections that you're doing, are they added to the thesaurus uh, with a default ontology? Um, I should write that down because that's actually a good suggestion. Only for a local users, the ones that are checked off, we should actually add them to the local users thesaurus, which gets tacked onto the system wide thesaurus. Um, yeah, I'm gonna write and then the matching, I really like the matching ontology where you match it to a standard ontology. So the matching, so say I've got plant height and it's, um, you know, in, in, an ontology might be height or something, and, and I've added, I've matched it to plant height as the standard ontology. Does that height then add, get added as uh, like a thesaurus of ontologies or alternate ontologies? Um, yeah, that's what How I. Do you uh, all these different ontologies. Right, that's what I alluded to earlier. That um, we don't at the moment incorporate those things from the ontologies to the spelling correction, but we should. Because we get situations where, at the moment, uh, the way that we're matching, uh, we're choosing which one to change everything to is the one with the highest frequency in your data set. And that's not always the best choice. Uh, in some cases, it might be, uh, they might be uh, switching away from a standard. Uh, in, that, in the case you just gave, they might be switching to plant height when actually the standard was height or something of that sort, uh, just because it's the highest frequency in the file. And that's something we want to change. Uh, as 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 we are working, you know, continually to um, improve this. But the first step where you actually matched it to a standard ontology, right? So you oh, do okay, have yeah. standard ontologies in the system. And then there's yeah. a second spell check of ontologies. Yeah, so let's step back for a moment. That first one I showed you, that is column headers. So we're actually now even saying what am I what data am I gathering? So that's only at the column header level. Now we're right, getting into you're matching that to a standard ontology in the system, right? Correct. I really yep. like that. Yep. So that's what that way we want to make sure that so I can compare variable to variable the same ones. We really want people to you know not use just the wrong term, series name versus name of series. Just use the same darn term, and then uh, then we can actually uh, compare better across data sets. Do um, you store the information that was in the headers or not? That just gets discarded, does it? No, that, no we, we never throw away uh, user data uh, information. Um, as you'll see, when I correct the spelling, I have a new version that gets tagged as a new version. It'll get linked to the original version, um, first of all. And second of all, uh, that ontology information that gets carried across, that just gets linked only in the, the JSON metadata file at the end. It says, you know that column that we said uh, saw that said uh, um, series name, uh, which was column four in the spreadsheet? Well, series name column four in the spreadsheet corresponds to the ontology term name of series uh, from the uh, agricultural um, ontology, uh, you know, something of that sort, or the crop, on, crop research ontology. Uh -huh. So it gets carried around. That way we can, when we do a search later with Elasticsearch, that says, give me all the data sets that actually characterize um, the na name of series uh, f from the crop research ontology, um, and give me all those data sets that, you know, which we're using the, the crop maze, then we can immediately find the right data sets and the right columns to match to each other. And when you're, are you reporting out data or data analysis, do you report out the original column headers that the user gave, or do you report out the new ontologies that you've mapped them to? That the user so if we, um, if we go, we, we report what the user gave, because the user may want to override and still want to match the ontology. And, but remember, um, let me go back, uh, back to column metadata. The user actually has an opportunity to, to actually change that right here. They it will by default. Um, um, the, the, they can actually change. Oops, why is there we go? Um, so they can actually change the name of what they uh, 
want to. And if they change it here, uh, then that would experiment, uh, well, I'm not sure what I would change that to, experiment name. <laughs> so they now they will have changed it. They didn't have to do that, but now they will have changed it. And they're still matching, you know, to experiment ID uh, is what it matches to, but they've actually changed it in the file there. Actually, I think that's the case. And are you expecting fairly experienced curators to be doing this mapping? I mean, we, we have this problem that, you know, we do this kind of mapping of user headers to our internal database tables, but they can always be mapped strongly. So how do you prevent users mapping to the wrong ontology here? Yeah, that, that's always a challenge. Um, and part of it is we try to make our automatic mapping uh, as intelligent as possible. But part of it uh, is we're, um, see, we, we, we have mixed feelings. On the one hand, we feel that the, the, the closer you are to actually having uh, pr produced the data, the more you should know what that data is. Um, that said, I agree with you. As a curator, you're more knowledgeable about data sets in general. <laughs> and that, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense kind of thing. Um, we actually are going to make this, uh, there's a couple, uh, our software engineer is actually working on a couple of enhancements to this. Right now when I, when I enter things, um, it's just telling me the name. That's not that useful. We want to be able to, to uh, mouse over or expand uh, to the actual description that ICASA used when they described agricultural systems so they could at least see the full definition and really assess for themselves, do I think that matches. That will help. But at the same point, your, your, your comments are well taken. We know that some people get lazy, even if it's their own data set, they don't have every incentive not to be lazy, but they still will do it, and, and they may assign it to the wrong one. And which ontologies are you using? Are you using a standard source of ontology for this, or have you developed your own? No, we're using standard ones. Uh, in fact, we're working very closely with the ontology community. Uh, we're putting in, um, you know, with uh, Marie Angelique, with uh, Meta, with uh, Elizabeth uh, Arnold, and uh, actually Pierre, Luigi, uh, a whole bunch of folks. We're we're work, uh, working together in a big NSF grant that uh, is due. Uh, actually, we missed this deadline, so we're going to do it for this coming fall. Um, but basically, we're we're very intertwined with that group. We ho hosted a summit this last June, and uh, pretty much everyone who's uh, who's known in the ontology community was part of that summit at the University of Minnesota this last June. So um, it's something we care a lot about, um, and, and we're going to try to make sure we do the best we can on it. Yeah, we just met with Elizabeth last week. She's talking mm -hmm. about coming to Washington D.C. in early or mid December, and then she's going to come to Cornell campus. So. I think there's quite a bit of we could uh, work on in the ontology and also analytics, how to bring different data sources in order to do the analytics. She wants yep. to contribute to the area. We yeah. find that the marker genotyping data is not very well developed in the ontology space. Um, there are a few areas. Uh, rap, uh, high throughput phenotyping is not well developed either. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of areas that actually really need a lot of work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, genetic genetic data in human is well defined. Genomics, yes. Is, but not so much. Deal with, or it's pretty. Are you bet. That's that. That's what we're. That's the subject of our grant proposal. It's uh. Okay. Sometimes you get the same term in four or five different ontologies, and they're not quite the same and trying to make more or less a, a unified web or network of ontologies for which there is a, uh, you know, a preferred uh, adopted standard across the different fields. That's, that's what this, the, the topic is. So. Yeah. So Kevin, I think we are at an hour we agreed on, and yep. this is really, really yeah, useful, interesting. Why don't yep. I set up another follow-up meeting? We can dive into more uh, on the analysis side. Yeah, I think that would be good because there's a uh, the analysis. I think would be fun to look at, um, and that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Also in the ontology group, so I know you already met with our curators in the phenomics. What's that called? The meeting at uh, Elizabeth Institute in September. Uh, which one? 
Abby shared the rosemary lay almond, so the one Elizabeth group posted. Uh -huh. I have a hard time saying the name. Anyway, yeah. I think it would be great that we can yeah. have a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We can collaborate in this. Oh, yeah. You mean if you know harmonious? Yeah, I was at that one. Right. Yeah. I don't know when's your grand proposal deal, if we could be part of the collaboration on the genomic or genotyping and the connecting of breeding analytics. That certainly is possible. When the grant, it's not going to be the NSF uh, proposal. They actually put it out all the way to September of next year. So it's not, you know, the problem, of course, we, we, we scurried because we found out about about a week or two before the last September when it was due. And it was like, oh, well, we didn't make it. So now, of course, probably what will happen is be quiet, quiet, quiet until June or July. <laughs> Hopefully not. But yeah. Um, okay, I'll keep. Yeah, ontology. I think Lee how maybe oh, we'll get together. together. Yeah, yeah. So we'll follow up with Elizabeth. Maybe arrange a separate uh, discussion on ontology, bring the data analytics, and also breeding data management system people. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We'll get back on that, and then for the next meeting, with similar time next Monday, we work. Yeah, we have another session to finish the demo. Yeah, next Monday, you're thinking? Yeah. Sorry, what did you say, Kevin? Uh, I was just asking, you said next Monday? Yeah, 26? the same time. But one week later from today. Yeah, 26th, let's see. Um, yeah. It, so Yao will be here. He's going to be at the ERA, right? No, no, so no, check. no. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so, then we'll discuss by email, let's try it. Yeah, okay. So, so I didn't catch, um, yeah. so, so Star, did you say next next Monday, or did that change because Yao is not available? I think we can meet Star, uh, but Yao yeah, might be busy. So yeah, we'll okay. I was hoping, just keep it simple next week, like 2 to 3. Yeah, set it up then, yeah. How about how about two thirty to three thirty? Only reason I say that is because we normally have the the, the meeting that Jesse camp canceled uh, every week, so it's one thirty to two thirty. I usually attend that. Um, okay. So if we make it like right after that, then like well, sorry, one thirty to two thirty our time, which is two thirty to three thirty your time. Um, okay. So it's three thirty. Okay. Yeah, two thirty to three thirty our time. Is that right? No, three thirty our time. No. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin Trey, again, you say it. Yeah, so so three thirty your time, if if that okay. works for you. Three thirty to four thirty. Yeah, I can't do that. Yeah, that's a little late. Yeah. Not Mondays. I can do it other days. Is that okay? Tuesday? How about Tuesday on the twenty seventh? Yeah, Tuesday I'm completely free. Um, yep. Tuesday we are completely full. Okay. Okay. Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> well, How Wednesday. Twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Uh, all mornings okay with me. Oh, uh, Wednesday morning we are very busy. Oh uh, wait, but but so how about also three o'clock to four o'clock? Your time works for me on Wednesday. Wednesday three to four is okay. <laughs> okay, time, sounds yeah. good. Okay, we are good. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll sure see you sometime. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Sure, okay, we'll talk bye to you now. next week. Ha yeah. Happy thanks. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Take care.